Hey there, everybody. It is Nurse Mo, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. This is episode 81, and today we're talking about schizophrenia. But as always, before we get into that, let's take a quick moment for a listener shout out. And today's listener shout out goes to Kate, who sent me a message on, I think it was through my Etsy shop where I sell the planners. And she says, I listen to your podcast religiously, and I constantly tell my peers about it. I feel lucky to have discovered it because you have helped me understand so many concepts so much better. I consider you my mentor from afar. XOXO, Kate. Kate, thank you so much for that nice note. I think I wrote you back and said you made my day. If I didn't, I meant to, and you absolutely did. So if you guys want to get a listener shout out, all you have to do is just send me a nice note like Kate did and tell me how the podcast has helped you. And preferably if you do that on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, then the positive reviews help us rank better and show up when other nursing students go searching for help when they're listening to their podcast. So thanks again, Kate. And thanks to all of you who have submitted your kind and thoughtful notes and reviews. I truly do appreciate it. And I read every single one and they all make me feel so happy. And then I read them to my husband and make him listen to it too. Okay. So today we're talking about schizophrenia and schizophrenia, as you know, is a psychiatric disorder. And what it does to people is it causes altered thoughts, um, altered perceptions of mood and altered behavior. It's considered a type of psychosis It has four subsets, and that includes schizoaffective disorder, paranoid schizophrenia, catatonic schizophrenia, and undifferentiated schizophrenia. And we're going to go through those more in just a moment. Um, The one of the more, it is one of the more serious and debilitating mental illnesses. But just be aware that schizophrenia does not usually cause a person to be violent or dangerous. It is considered a chronic brain disorder that can be managed with psychiatric treatment and appropriate medication therapy. So who does schizophrenia affect? Well, the research shows that it does affect men and women equally, though the typical onset in males is generally earlier. Um, in general, the symptoms begin to show in the in men in like their late teens to early 20s and for women, late 20s to early 30s. So let's start off by talking about the symptoms of schizophrenia. So the severity of these symptoms are really going to vary very widely from person to person. Also, symptoms can be exacerbated by stress, by the use of alcohol or drugs, and of course, by failure to comply with their uh, pharmacological regimens. So we have four categories of schizophrenia symptoms. We have positive symptoms, negative symptoms, impaired cognition, and disorganization symptoms. So positive symptoms, those are the ones that the that the individual experiences that are like think of them as like additions to reality. So this would be things like hallucinations, like seeing things that aren't there or hearing voices that aren't there, distorted perceptions and delusions, things like that. They're positive symptoms. Then we have negative symptoms. This is where something is not there. It's lacking. So this would be um, the loss of the ability to speak or to move or express emotion, um, take action, find pleasure in things. Those are considered negative symptoms. Impaired cognition, um, that's typically uh, difficulty concentrating, declining intellectual capabilities, problems with memory. That would be the impaired cognition type of symptom. And then we have disorganization symptoms. And these are symptoms that exhibit as confusion, really bizarre behavior, abnormal body movements, disordered speech, and trouble exhibiting logical speech patterns. So those are the four kind of categories of symptoms that you'll see. If you hear it broken down um, into just positive and negative, that happens a lot. Um, 
just know that the positive ones are the kind of like the patient has added things that aren't there, hallucinating, delusions, things like that. And the negative symptoms are they're lacking something, lacking um, the ability to take action or um, maybe speaking, even movement. So four types of symptoms. And then let's just talk a little bit about some of these, um, break these down a little bit more. So when we're looking at, let's start with looking at disorganized speech, because I mentioned that um, as one of the disorganization symptoms. So speech patterns of patients with schizophrenia, they're going to take on, you know, they can take on many different forms and your exams will have these on there and you may be using it in your care plans as well. So it's important to know what the terms are and what they mean. So word salad is probably one of the most common ones that you'll see um, in person and on exam questions. So word salad is words that are strung together that have no relationship to one another. You may hear it called paraphrasia as well, but typically people just call it word salad, and that's just a jumble of words that just don't belong together. Then we have pressured speech. So pressured speech is that speech that occurs very rapidly. It's really hard for you to listen and understand what the person is saying. The speaker may not pause at appropriate points, like they don't have those natural commas and periods in their speech pattern. They just don't pause. And the words can be jumbled together as well. So that is pressured speech. And then neologisms, these are made up words or common words used in a bizarre manner. Um, I can't even think of a made up word, um, fud liquor. I don't even know what that is, but that might be a word that a patient with schizophrenia would say as they're pointing to, you know, they want you, they want you to hand them the fork and they, they make up another weird, bizarre word for fork. Um, that is an example of a neologism. And then echolalia is when patients mimic what others are saying. You know how those little kids will do on the playground? Echolalia is mimicking what other people are saying. And then clang associations, that's grouping words together based on similar sounds. And they're not logically based together. They don't belong together in whatever the patient is trying to convey. The idea they're conveying, the words simply rhyme. And sometimes they only partially rhyme. So fox, box, locks, socks. There, we just did a clang association. Okay, so those are the disorganized speech patterns. Now let's take a look at disorganized thinking. So disorganized thinking is going to present in a variety of ways as well. So we have loose associations. So that's incoherent thinking that's expressed with frequent changes in topic. There's not really an association between one thing and the next. They're loose. So that's what that means. And then we have tangentiality. So the speaker's train of thought will lack focus and veer off topic and never return back to the original topic of discussion. They'll start out talking with you about their cat and then they're talking to you about the tires on the car and they never come back to talking about the cat. <laughs> so they have had tangentiality when they do that. And then there's circumstantiality. This is when the speaker's focus will drift, but will come back to the main point. So they may be starting out talking to you about their cat, and then they mention that their cat hates taking car rides, and that reminds them, oh yeah, I've got to get my tires fixed. And then they go on about their car for a while, and then they come back to the cat. So they do get their way back there eventually. I feel like that happens to me, like I do that a lot. And then we have thought blocking. This is where the thought process ends very abruptly and it's just a sudden abrupt stop in speech, you know, mid-thought, mid-sentence, whatever, just done. And then concrete thinking. That's thinking that revolves around actual objects and events and does not pertain to generalizations or concepts or ideas. So they're not able to have conversations about conceptual things or ideas, but only can converse about physical objects that are right there. Okay, so that's disorganized thinking. And then we have negative symptoms. So let's talk about what the negative symptoms are are in a little bit more detail. So negative symptom 
Number one that you'll probably notice is called a flat affect. You may also see this called incongruence. So basically, it's an absence of emotive expression. I might mispronounce some of these. Alogia, alogia, it's A-L-O-G-I-A, also known as poverty of speech. And this is the patient only gives very brief responses to questions, or they may not speak at all, or only when prompted. So you ask them a question that would normally elicit, you know, a, a whole sentence or a couple sentence answer, and their answer is always simply very brief, yes, no, whatever. So... Poverty of speech is that very brief response or not speaking at all. Abolition is the inability to initiate activities. And then anhedonia is the inability to feel pleasure. And those two sometimes will go hand in hand. Apathy is the lack of concern or emotion to things that are typically considered important, things that would typically get a reaction out of someone. They're very apathetic towards that. And then asociality is a lack of engagement in social interaction. So those are some negative symptoms. And then let's talk about delusions and hallucinations, which, as you recall, are positive symptoms. We'll start first with the different types of delusions that a patient with schizophrenia may have. So there's a persecutory delusion. This is the individual uh, feeling like they are being persecuted and that other people are out to harm them. You may also hear these referred to as paranoid delusions. Um, You know, that makes people very suspicious of others and can make it really hard for people to have good positive relationships and even um, do normal things like hold a job. So paranoid delusions, persecutory delusions, uh, interchangeable terms there. Then we have grandiose delusion, which is the individual believing uh, their own importance is all-encompassing. They have a very exaggerated sense of their own importance. A somatic delusion. This is where the individual believes they've got a serious medical problem or a physical defect when none exists. Like they may believe they have a, a third arm that is part of their body. So that is not real, but they are absolutely convinced of it. Jealous delusions. This is when the individual is very convinced that their partner is being unfaithful when there is no evidence to that fact. Religious delusions occur. And when this happens, the individual um, has delusions that are of a religious nature, such as believing they are a saint. They may think they are, you know, a god. They have these, and it's kind of mixes in with that grandiose delusion as well. Erotomanic delusions, uh, that's when the individual believes that someone else is just absolutely in love with them or even obsessed with them when there is absolutely no evidence to that either. And then delusion of control is the belief that another person, another group um, is controlling that individual's behavior, their feelings, their thoughts. And then mixed delusions are when more than one type is displayed. So those are some of the different types of delusions that your patient with schizophrenia could have. And then there's different types of hallucinations. So visual hallucinations, that's when the individual um, sees things very vividly. You know, it can be animals, it can be objects, religious figures, other people. Sometimes the individual finds them frightening. Many times they do not. Um, The individual may or may not realize that the hallucinations are real. Sometimes uh, patients with schizophrenia will have hallucinations, but they will know that's not real because, you know, they're managing their symptoms. Maybe they're taking their medication as they should. Perhaps they still see some of these um, hallucinations, but they have the wherewithal to not believe that they're actually real. Then there's auditory hallucinations. This individual may hear voices, maybe one, maybe more. They could be perceived as very demanding, very... um, urgent voices telling them to do things. It could be whispers. It could be murmurs. It could be music. Um, It affects a lot of patients with schizophrenia. More than 70% have auditory hallucinations. And then there's tactile hallucinations. The the individual feels that their body's being touched when there is nobody touching them. There's nothing touching them. They just feel like they're being touched. 
gustatory hallucinations. This would be the individual tasting something that they have not, there's nothing in their oral cavity. Often it's a chemical taste or like a rotten garbage kind of taste. It can't be, it can't be enjoyable. You know, why isn't it ice cream or chocolate? I don't know, but typically it's uh, an unpleasant stimulus. And then command hallucinations. These are typically auditory in nature and instruct the patient to take action. Um, it could be something innocent or it could be something very dangerous. So those are the different types of hallucinations that a patient could be having. I do remember working in a mental health facility as a student in the intensive care unit. And that's where the uh, schizophrenic patients were housed that were needed a, a lot higher level of care. And um, it was very interesting to see um, all the different ways that these delusions, hallucinations, and things like that can be exhibited. I had the great pleasure of working with a gentleman who um, definitely had the religious um, delusion and also grandiose delusion. He was very kind. He offered me a, a position high in the American government and also believed that he was God or Jesus. I can't remember which one, but he, I mean, he was convinced. He was absolutely convinced that this was true. And he was also brilliant. And we had a lovely, lovely conversation. But um, other than getting a job offer, <laughs> um, yeah, that was just a really interesting day in the intensive care unit. There were a lot of different other patients there as well who many of them had schizophrenia and other types of things. And just seeing the wide range of symptoms that could be displayed was really eye-opening and very, very interesting. Okay, so let's move on and talk about the different types of schizophrenia. So I mentioned um, in the beginning that there are several different types. So let's start with paranoid schizophrenia schizophrenia, that's probably the one that I would say is the when maybe when you think of schizophrenia, this is the one that comes to mind. So an individual with paranoid schizophrenia will display positive symptoms, which we've already talked about, in the form of delusions. And these delusions are paranoid, okay? So he will be unreasonably suspicious. He may have auditory hallucinations as well that confirm those suspicions. If he has negative symptoms, these are going to be the inability to find pleasure in life or show appropriate emotional responses. And this is the most common subtype of schizophrenia, the paranoid schizophrenia. And then we have the catatonic schizophrenia. So this is a relatively rare type, and it's generally believed to be due to disease that's been left to persist and gone untreated for a while. So the patient could have either significant decreases in body movement to the point of being immobile or actually resist being manually moved, or they could have significantly increased movement, but it's not purposeful movement. So this increased movement can be seen as echopraxia, which is the mimicking of others' movements, bizarre posturing, rocking, or echolalia, that repeating what others say. Many times patients with catatonic schizophrenia will remain immobile just for hours and avoid eating, avoid drinking, avoid going to the bathroom. So when a patient is immobile and in that catatonic state for long enough, it does become a medical emergency and they need urgent treatment. Another type of schizophrenia is disorganized schizophrenia. So this form involves that disorganized speech and behavior in a flat or inappropriate affect. So this patient's going to have that incoherent speech, uh, do that word salad that we talked about. Her behavior will be also disorganized, won't be able to act appropriately in social situations, won't be able to start or finish tasks. She might not be able to make proper eye contact or display facial expressions. You may also see disorganized schizophrenia referred to as hebephrenic schizophrenia, but mostly I just see the term disorganized. 
Then we have undifferentiated schizophrenia. And this is kind of a catch-all category for those who don't don't kind of fit neatly into the ones that we've already mentioned. These patients will have signs and symptoms that fit into two or more of the other subtypes, um, such as delusions, catatonia, disorganized speech, hallucinations, etc. Okay, then we have something called residual schizophrenia. So when patients are not experiencing significant symptoms of disorganized behavior, hallucinations, delusions, or catatonia, they may still have distorted thoughts and distorted beliefs or lots of negative symptoms. So when this is the case, we say they're having residual schizophrenia. And then there's schizoaffective disorder, which is another important thing to know. And this is when the patient has schizophrenia along with a mood disorder like mania, hypomania, or depression. So we call this schizoaffective disorder. And treatment for these patients can be really challenging because not only do you have to treat the psychotic disorder, you also have to treat the mood imbalance as well. So let's talk about how we treat schizophrenia. So basically, schizophrenia is treated pharmacologically with uh, antipsychotics, neuroleptics, benzodiazepines, and antidepressants. And one of the biggest challenges with the pharmacological management of patients with schizophrenia is non-adherence to medication regimens because the side effects are can be pretty undesirable. So because the side effect profiles are pretty unattractive, it's very important that these patients take the lowest possible dose in order to manage their symptoms. And uh, this is a really complex topic. I think we'll do a whole, we could do a whole series on, um, on psychopharmacology. So maybe we'll do some of that in the future. But um, just know that antipsychotic medications are available in multiple formulations, which is great because that makes it easier to administer based on what that individual needs and what they prefer. For example, there's uh, depot injections that are given once a month. And that's indicated for the patient who is non-adherent uh, and possibly that might be the only way that they get their medication is if they only have to get it once a month. Other medications are given intramuscularly for acute psychotic episodes and others are given in tablets and liquids. So when I was in the ICU at the mental health facility as a student, they explained to us the procedure of what would happen if a patient went into a psychotic episode and was a danger to himself or others. And it was called the takedown and it just sounded so scary. And they would have to restrain, like physically restrain the patient. I forget how many people, like four or five people would have to physically restrain the patient and take them into this little locked room and um, inject them with something like Haldol or something or Geodon or some kind of antipsychotic medication intramuscularly. Um, and then the patient would calm down. Um, and then the caregivers could leave the room and leave the patient in there, you know, supervised. There's a window but and safe. So I just found that really interesting. Thankfully, there weren't any takedowns when I was there. But I have had to give patients in the hospital um, antipsychotic medications as intramuscular injections. And I'm telling you, man, those things work. Um, Geodon, man. That stuff will put you out, um, hours of just out. (laughs) So um, very highly effective medications when they are needed. So, um, and again, tablets and liquids for patients who are more, you know, more adherent and participating more um, positively and appropriately in their medical care. So what are some other treatments for schizophrenia? So aside from medication, they may need therapy. Well, probably will need therapy. And that's individual therapy, family therapy as well well because it really does take a whole village to um, treat these patients effectively. They may get vocational rehabilitation, and this would help them with um, job training, finding appropriate work, keeping work, all of those sorts of things. Social skills training may be needed to help the person participate in a society and be more appropriate with their relationships out in public, at their job, wherever they are. 
ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, yes, it is still something that is used. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about depression because it's it's used, as far as what I saw as a student, it seemed to be used more for a very severe debilitating depression. And it's really interesting. So we'll definitely talk about that. And then hospitalization would be necessary when their symptoms are really severe and they're unable to take care of themselves they're a danger to themselves or they're a danger to anyone else. So before I go, I want to give you a few bits of advice for communicating with a patient with schizophrenia. Um, really the key, and this will be on your exams, I promise. The key to communicating with a patient with schizophrenia is keeping your conversation focused on reality. So if they're having a hallucination or delusion, you're not going to agree or disagree with it. If you disagree with it, you're going to get into an argument with them. And if you agree with it, you're perpetuating their um, hallucination or delusion. So rather than asking them questions um, about their delusion or hallucination, it's more important to reinforce anything in the conversation that is grounded in reality. You can state what your reality is. No, so for instance, um, and you're going to do this in a very non-judgmental, non-confrontational way, and you want to respect their feelings. So if John is just adamant that there are snakes crawling on his bed, I'm not going to ask him about the snakes or tell him there are no snakes or tell him that there are snakes. What I'm going to do is say, I don't see the snakes, John. So I'm telling him what my reality is, and then I want to respect his feelings. And I will. I could say, do they frighten you? And then he could, you know, if and then sometimes, you know, people actually say no, or they may say yes. So, you know, you just have to go on with it. Um, I would think snakes would be mostly frightening, but I have had um, patients who hear voices, and we've had to have very frank, open conversations about um I don't hear those voices, but let me know if they frighten you and if you have any concerns. And then sometimes they'll say, um, I'm hearing the voices, but you don't hear them. I know they're not real. I'm not afraid right now. But, you know, obviously that can change. So just being very um, grounded in reality, that is the key. Okay, you want to respect their feelings and the fact that they are experiencing this to them. It is very real. And then you also want to speak slowly, which is very hard for me. I'm sure you can imagine that. And calmly in a very non-judgmental way. You want to avoid quick body movements. That can be startling. And you want to avoid touching because that could be, um, that could be triggering and startling for them as well. Always make sure you've got an exit easily accessible. So you wouldn't want to get in a position where the patient was blocking your exit from the room. So always keep your exit easily accessible so you cannot get cornered by someone who becomes um, a danger to himself or you. And as always, just when you're thinking about your patients with... Um, mental disorders, especially any kind of psychosis, if you keep your interventions focused on safety, both your own safety and their safety, you will, um, you'll go a long way towards doing the right thing. So I hope that all of that advice and information helps you maybe feel less nervous about taking care of these patients in the clinical setting and doing well on those very, very tricky uh, mental health nursing exams. So today is December 19th. If you're listening to this episode on the day that it drops, and I just want to let you know there is still time to enroll in Crucial Concepts Boot Camp. If you are an incoming nursing student, I made this course for you. So I encourage you to go to straightanursingstudent.com, click on the uh, navigation bar, for boot camp. Um, there may also be some other spots there on the homepage to access it, but you should always be able to access it through the menu bar, other under courses or boot camp. I'm changing the website around a little bit, but I promise it will be easy to find and then you can get all the information 
there. Um, Take care, everyone. I hope you're enjoying. Maybe finals are finished or close to getting finished. So I hope that's the case for you and that you get a little R&R before things start up again. And if you're one of my students that's graduating, congratulations. Take a break before you start stressing about the NCLEX, okay? (laughs) You got plenty of time to study for that. Take a little bit of a break, guys. And I will see you back here next week. Let's see what we're talking about next week. Next week's topic is, oh, head-to-toe assessment. So a lot of people really struggling with fundamentals. And one of the things I'm hearing a lot about is head-to-toe assessments. So I realize those of you that had mentioned this a few weeks ago, it's probably too late for you now because the semester will be over. But for those of you coming in, I guarantee you head-to-toe assessment, big, big component of your fundamentals and your um, learning how to assess patients component, probably have a big checkoff skill associated with it. So we're going to go through it from top to bottom. I'm going to tell you how you're going to do amazing and how to study and prepare for that examination. So I'll see you back here next week. Until then, take good care of yourselves and have a good one. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. 